Hi, I'm Virgil Fox, I'm a member, and this is my solo show this year. Um, I know it's difficult to travel right now for a lot of people, so I thought I'd invite you to come along and visit some of my favorite places. This is the Pacific Coast, starting at the Dungeness Spit at the very top of Washington in Olympic National Park. Um, what I love about this part of the world is the windswept trees. It's obvious that the wind has just taken these trees and bent them to its will, and they seem to beckon you to follow this little trail out to the spit which you have to be very careful when you get on the spit because the tide comes in and uh, you have to be able to get back before, before the tide will swallow you. In the whole rainforest there are tons of waterfalls all over Olympic National Park and it's, uh, it's just a magical place right out of a Tolkien novel. In the Oregon coast, con continuing down the west coast, there are these wonderful little places where there are sea stacks out on the horizon that you, that you can take uh, just to contemplate the eternal verities that you, as you sit there on the shore. There's an area near Astoria that has these wonderful sculpted hedges and I've, I've got a piece in that depicts that. Also in the whole rainforest, there are lots of ferns everywhere you look, and I decided to try a different alternative photo process with these. Um, one of them is, uh, well, they're actually both cyanotypes done in a different way. I take a piece of paper and coat it with a light sensitive emulsion, and then I create a negative um, from a positive image. I print it out on a transparency and I sit it on this light sensitive paper and put that in the sun and that creates, that prints the image, the sun prints it. Um, some people call it a sun print. Um, there are anemones all over the coast, um, little creatures in these tide pools and I just I find that magical. I saw my first starfish in person on the Oregon coast which uh, at first I thought someone had thrown a little orange wrapper from something from far away. I didn't have my glasses on and as I proceeded closer to it, I discovered it's, there was a little starfish. So uh, I was like a kid in a candy store watching this little starfish move around. Another of my favorite places is Rialto Beach, which is near the town of Forks of Twilight fame. If you've read any of those novels or seen the movies. Um, and again, just more Oregon sea stacks. Um, there are a couple of little cyanotypes that, uh, one of which is an Oregon sea stack and another of my friend Patrick making a little trail in the sand. Now we head to the Yucatan Peninsula. Which is this big elephant trunk looking thing sticking out from the east coast of Mexico. The big city there is Merida, which is a, a, an international, um, wonderfully urban, uh, place with a lots, lot of art and music and Maya, French, Spanish, and African culture all over the, the uh, peninsula. The rural parts of it are my favorite though because the people are just genuinely interested in you and what you're doing. A lot of uh, what used to be grand haciendas where they grew henequen as a crop and to make rope and other things out of have now fallen into ruin, but what remains are these wonderful places that are covered in vines, and it's just a, a magical feeling to them. 
The people still exercise their wonderful traditions of processions all over the place, moving saints from one church to another. There still is Hennekin farming there, and I've got a picture of a, a Hennekin field. Another place is Mineral de Pozos, which I also have a photograph from there, and the town of Guanajuato, which is famous for the Cervantes Festival. They, they are really celebrate the author of Cervantes and his, one of his popular heroes, Don Quixote. One of my favorite aspects of, of this are just the wonderful ruins that are left over from the grand haciendas that used to be there to, that really were like the center of the town. The town grew up around these plantations and a lot of the villages are still there and thriving. The haciendas are pretty much in ruins now, but still beautiful in their own way. A vibrant, um, very youthful place. They just, they perform all over the city. It seems like everywhere you turn, there's a little party or a, a little dance just sprouting up right before your eyes. The point at which Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico come together is called the Four Corners. There's this one little bitty spot on the map where a lot of people go and take their picture. Um, and if you take, if you draw a huge circle around that area, you will create the, what is known as the Grand Circle. There's just a huge amount of wonderful, magical places in the Grand Circle. It is Navajo country, and the Navajo are very welcoming people and really are very proud of the area that, uh, that they call their nation and will take you on guided tours in different places where the um, people that aren't Navajo are not allowed. And I, I certainly respect the fact that they care so much about their land, that they're, they're wonderful stewards of these places and they want to make sure that people not only respect the land but get to know it from their viewpoint and they're very gracious and um, just wealth a wealth of knowledge about the land and its past and the spirit of the land and you can feel that when you're there Bryce Canyon is, is just an incredibly uh, layered magical place. I mean, just one layer of um, rock formations after another. Some of the lesser known parks are some of my favorites as well. Goblin Valley is a state park in Utah and the film Galaxy Quest was shot there. If you've ever seen Galaxy Quest, it's a, it's a really uh, funny um, little movie. It's about uh, these people who who are on this science fiction show similar to Star Trek and they're actually transported to Earth somehow and these kids find out that, uh, that they're actually real. So a lot of that was shot in, in Goblin Valley. It does look like an alien landscape. Another area that reminds me of, of an alien landscape is Kodachrome National Park. It was named that by a fellow who thought it was so colorful that that he named it Kodachrome. And it is pretty much next door to Bryce Canyon, not nearly as well visited, and that's why we enjoy Kodachrome. We hiked up to this vista right before dawn, and the sun was just barely coming out, but before that happened, the fog rose up and just swallowed us. Uh, as the sun came out more, it revealed this incredible landscape which to me look it either looks like an old city in China maybe I imagined some of these structures as as little places where people might have lived in there somehow but it just really has a, a magical quality to it
Orleans is my hometown and I'm obviously very fond of it. One of the places that I find very special is a, is a quiet little room next to a chapel at St. Rock Church, which is located in the neighborhood of the same name. St. Rock is the patron saint of the sick and infirm, so people from all across the, the parish there bring little offerings in the hopes that St. Rock will help their loved ones get better from whatever's ailing them. And um, I just find it a, a very wonderful place. The, the energy there is very comforting. One of our big parties during the year is Mardi Gras. And but one of my other favorite times is Super Sunday, which is the Sunday closest to St. Joseph's Day. So it's a big time of celebration. It follows Mardi Gras. And on this Super Sunday, the Mardi Gras Indians invite the whole city to visit their neighborhood, which is in Central City, and for just a day of fellowship and partying and tons of food and you know, cold drinks and everyone has a great time. One of my favorite characters uh, of, of all the Mardi Gras Indians is Big Chief Spoon, who was accommodating enough to let me take about a dozen shots of him while people were jumping in between us trying to get selfies. And I finally ended up just pulling out this huge wide angle lens and, and hitting the ground right in front of him so they couldn't get between us. And I pointed the camera up and, and got my shot. With the drum circle, I was invited into the drum circle. I think they kind of felt sorry for me of my difficulty in getting a shot. So they just kind of brought me into the middle of it. And I started uh, shooting photographs and filming a video in the midst of this circle. There are people s swirling all around me and the, the drum beats are just really fantastic. Um, I had a wonderful time shooting these guys and uh, just a tremendous amount of fun. Chaco Canyon is a very difficult place to journey to. We were warned about this by lots of different people, but we had, you have no idea what it's like until you get on the road. Um, it's kind of like a little washboard for most of the way back. I think it's about a 30 mile trip from the main highway, but the washboard is not really the problem. That's, it's bumpy, but then you enter craters in the middle of the road and sometimes the road will be washed out so you need to to make sure you get a good forecast before you you head out toward Chaco. It's just a very mystical place. I mean you can feel the ancient Puebloan people as you stroll around all of the ruins in Chaco. The Grand Kiva is certainly a popular um, destination for a lot of people. You can there is that that strong energy from that place as well and for this particular photograph I decided to do a solarization process on it and the sky is all painted it it's just something that I did uh, to go along with the, the solarized process that I did on the photograph but it it speaks to what I felt and what I really saw sort of in my mind's eye as I looked at this wonderful um, Grand Kiva from the ancient past. Canyon de Chez is just one beautiful vista after another, one overlook after another to these wonderful canyons. This particular image came from Canyon del Muerto, which you have to hike down to with a Navajo guide. There are a lot of places you can't go and Canyon de Chez, except with a Navajo guide. Uh, our guide was actually one of the park rangers and he took a group of us down there. It's, it's more of a climb than a hike. You'll be scrambling over slick rock and you'll be doing a lot of climbing both down and, and back. So uh, be prepared for that. But down there, there are all these wonderful little cliff dwellings that, that you can see. Crater Lake is something otherworldly looking from the shore. You can look out, there's a little island out there. 
you can take a boat to that island. We, we elected not to do that, but uh, it was getting cold when we were there. In fact, we were, we were camping and we were going to stay for a couple of nights, but the, the night after we first got there, it was forecast to get down in the low 30s. So that's a little beyond our sleeping on the ground. We weren't quite equipped to sleep on the ground in that temperature, so uh, we only had one night, but it was a, a wonderful one night to spend there at Crater Lake. Uh, for the image, the bottom image there, I did a lot of that with paint um, and melting the wax to move the paint around, and that, that was a lot of fun to play with. This section of the exhibit is the, uh, on O'Keeffe country. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe and her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, are two of my heroes. Um, Stieglitz spent a large portion of his young life in the early 20th century establishing photography as an art form in New York City. And he had a long uphill battle. A lot of people didn't consider photography art at that point, but uh, he made his case very effectively. He and Edward Steichen were two of the people who were uh, responsible for setting up the photography department at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. One of the other things that uh, Alfred Stieglitz did was to promote the work of young artists in New York, his wife being chief among those artists. She decided to go to explore New Mexico and fell in love with it and decided to stay there. And for many years, she painted these iconic hills and the juniper studded hills and uh, cobalt blue skies and just the wonderful uh, cow skulls and the rivers and all over the region. Uh, one of her favorite places was Plaza Blanca, what she called the white place. The, the rocks there are very pale, unlike a lot of the red rock country. They're, these are pale, sort of grayish white. And for one of the pieces, it started out as a black and white photograph and I carved out, I incised little marks into the rock to sort of delineate the, the texture of the rock. And I, I painted those with some dark umber and then I painted the sky with other oil-based paints. It sort of reminds me of an old book illustration, which uh, that's sort of what I was going for here. In the town of Abiquiu, which is about 45 minutes north of Santa Fe, uh, Georgia had a home which was right around the corner from this old Spanish mission called the Penitente Morada. And uh, this is a cyanotype that I then I made the, the cyanotype and then soaked it in tea so that it changed colors to a, more of a, a brownish or blue tone instead of the bright blue that straight cyanotype gives you. And I put a little, some uh, wax and paint on top of that. It gives it a little bit of an antique look. The Chama River was another one of George O'Keefe's favorite subjects. She painted it again and again. It, it's just really spectacular the way it forks and as the clouds roll in it just can you can get a lot of drama from uh, from that river from that particular overlook which is between the town of Abiquiu and Abiquiu Lake uh, there's a little vantage point so you have to be sure you're very careful pulling off the road because it's on a curve and, uh, it's uh, but it's a wonderful vantage point to see the Chama River and in many cases, there's this little glistening sun off of it. You never know what you're going to get in that vista. The large black and white photograph is reminds me of the Sagrada Familia, the cathedral in Barcelona by Gaudi. He used a lot of organic um, rock formations, I think, as, for, as the inspiration for the cathedral. And there's just one structure after another with these formations and all from the wind and the, and the water and the shifting earth. It's, it's just a magnificent um, creation and a place that I could spend many, many more weeks visiting.
Yosemite National Park is a place I had never been before this particular trip. Um, and I had no idea. Obviously, you've seen pictures of Yosemite, but you have no idea what's in store for you until you get there. It's just a vast, the valley itself is vast, and there are other areas to explore beyond the valley. We spent all of our time uh, in the valley, which is the most visited part of it. The people in front of us asked the ranger as we were checking in, uh, if you only had one day to spend in Yosemite, what would you do? And he said, I would cry. And I know after being there for a week, what he meant by that. And a week is not even enough in Yosemite. The place that sticks most in my memory is uh, Vernal Falls. We hiked up this very steep uh, incline with a mixture of steps and slick rock and trails that you climb seemingly straight up. It's wet, it's slippery, and if you uh, make a mistake, you may end up uh, at the bottom and um, not in good shape. So of course we had to climb all the way to the top. Um, the, at the top there's this wonderful sh mist shrouded landscape of trees and, and uh, rock and just endless variations of color. And these two particular areas struck me as a, almost like an abstract painting. So as I photographed them, I tried to make the water a little slower moving down the, the face of the rock so you could detect some motion out of it and that it didn't work as well as some of the smooth, perfectly smooth water that you see in these photographs, but it was during the day, so, and sort of on the fly. Not a lot has been done to this other than putting some wax and texture on it. I did bring out the color a little bit with some paint, but uh, it was there, <laughs> just like magic, this wonderful abstract uh, rock formation and from years of different chemicals sliding down the, the face of the rock from the water and uh, other just changing elements of the rock. The other two photographs from Yosemite are the tunnel view, which is pretty, a pretty popular uh, shot of, of the Yosemite Valley but one that I never tire looking at, and how many ever pictures I see of it, I still like it. One of the reasons we were able to stay in Yosemite for a week is that it, the, it was a very dry season that year, and normally there aren't any campsites at all. We were able to stay there for a week, but we had to keep moving to different sites. Since it was dry, when we got to Mirror Lake, there's no water in the lake. So I was able to stand right there and get this shot of the Half Dome the, you'll see the half dome way in the distance from tunnel view, but then when you get right up on the half dome, uh, you can see there's a figure that looks like a little man off to the right. And from that vantage point, it's, it's hard to get a picture from this vantage point because you ordinarily would be standing in the middle of Mirror Lake. So I was able to get that, that particular shot and uh, the little man is one of my favorite aspects of the, the uh, half dome, which is possibly the most photographed thing in Yosemite. I have not seen too many of this particular angle, but again, it's due to where you have to be to take that shot. Thank you for joining us. I hope you had a good time traveling around with me at some of my favorite places. And I hope you have a chance to come down to Ava. We'll be here with this show until September the 18th. Uh, any questions you may have, the uh, uh, staff here is very knowledgeable about my subject matter and, and me. So you could ask them. And thanks again.